Did you give your own introduction? Yeah. Why not? You are. <laughs> okay. You're <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Uh, we're now going to start. Um, um, for everyone who has showed up to the actual in person meeting, thank you very much, also. And also, anyone who is attending to the webinar, thanks for dialing in. Here, um, Neil Katz has uh, graciously uh, agreed to present with a joint uh, webinar slash seminar with IBIPSA Chicago and Chicago Computation Group. I've met uh, Neil July 2013 at Harvard while we were taking a course at Diva, and it was, it's been interesting ever since then. And he's an architect with Skidmore Owings and Merrill, which we are currently located right now for this gathering. He uses computational design approach to, he, he uses computational design approach to design and has also used a methodology in developing geometry, simple and complex, as a way of analyzing and designing in response to many project goals, including environmental and sustainability goals. Uh, computational design aspects of which include algorithmic and parametric design as well as building information modeling, BIM, is a much of a way of thinking about design is using and developing tools for design. Neil has taught at various schools and is often invited to speak at his work at schools and conferences. And uh, again, thank you very much, Neil. Thanks. With that, I leave the floor to you. Thanks, Yuhi. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And welcome. Uh, I see some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, analysis, simulation, visualization, a little bit about optimization as a design tool, primarily, and about how we use some of these um, aspects in, in the work that we do here at the office. Um, I'll talk about them generally a little bit, but then also show some examples, some case studies of how we've used these on projects. Um, we do many different types of analysis, from environmental analysis, shadow analysis, daylighting, um, glare, energy modeling. Um, we also do other kinds of analysis that are less environmental. So we do code analysis, zoning analysis, um, if a building has a straight shape, if it's twisted, we do a lot of geometry analysis and fabrication analysis. Um, and I'll show a couple of examples of those as well, because I think they're interesting and also relate to some of the environmental studies that we do. We use a whole bunch of tools. Um, the ones at the top are used not only by the engineers, but also by the architects, maybe some of them only by the architects. So we, we, we try to, when we're designing a project, get the architects as much involved in the analysis as, as we can, because it really has an important influence on the design of the project. If we understand a lot of the issues in terms of energy and daylighting, it, it has a huge impact on how the building is designed, hopefully a positive impact. We've also developed a lot of customized tools to do some of the analysis that we do. So we're using Rhino with Grasshopper. We do a lot of development in Grasshopper to, to do these kinds of analyses. Um, we're starting to use Dynamo in, in Revit to do also customization um, to allow us to do an analysis that there aren't yet tools available for, um, or tools that will analyze some of the buildings, some of the projects that we're working on. Um, I also listed AutoCAD and Lisp scripting, and I think I'm, I'm the only one at the office that's <laughs> using that tool to, <laughs> to do analysis. Um, we're also looking at um, parametric and iterative analysis. So if, if we're studying an aspect of a building like, like fins on a tower, we want to know how big should the fins be? How much should they be spaced? How deep should they be? Um, should they be angled? So we'll do some iterative analyses and test many um, val variables of, of those parameters and to see which one is best. So that's almost optimization in a way. Um, we're also looking at, because some of these analyses take so long, especially the iterative analyses, where we're testing hundreds of, of variables, hundreds of iterations of a model that can take hours on a, on a single machine. So also looking at using parallel processing and cloud computing to make that process faster. If the process is fast enough, then it's usable as a design, as a design tool. If it takes too long, then we're not going to do it or it won't be done in time for us to, to use that information, to use that data. These are some examples of some of the projects that we've worked on over many years. Um, Skid Mowings and Merrill is over 80 years old. We were founded in 1936. Um, I don't think any projects on this page are that old, but um, we, we, we're multidisciplinary. So we do interiors work, we do city planning in addition to architecture. Um, 
in terms of architecture, we do many different kinds of projects from um, you know, super tall commercial office buildings to mixed use. Um, we do um, theaters, we do furniture, we do religious buildings. We did this mosque in New York, um, first Khalifa, so a variety of, of, of different kinds of projects. All of them involve some kind of analyses. Even the buildings that we've done 30 and 40 years ago, we, we did analyses, um, sometimes not using computational tools, but, but nonetheless, we, we still need to figure out what's the best design for this particular um, goal that we're trying to achieve. Some examples of, of different kinds of analyses that we do, from reflection analyses to uh, energy analysis, um, structural analysis. Um, we have a couple of research groups in the office. One of them is the Black Box Group, which I'm a member of. And we research um, primarily tools, but also other conceptual aspects of the work that we do um, for the architects. And we also have a research group in our structures department. And other groups are also starting research groups. So our interiors group is also starting to look at um, research in the ways that people work, um, different kinds of office environments. Um, our urban design group is also um, researching different aspects of, of city design and modeling. A couple of examples are reflection analyses, um, which we developed some tools for in Grasshopper. So this, this was done using a Grasshopper script. Uh, we tested three heliostats on the top of a building um, that has an atrium. And the goal here was to drive light down into the atrium by installing a fixture at the top, a heliostat, that will reflect the sunlight coming in from different angles, different times of the day, different times of the year. And what shape will work the best? And we didn't really optimize. We didn't test hundreds of shapes and find out which one is the best. We looked at three shapes. Um, one of them is a cylinder. We knew that wouldn't do well, but that was sort of our test case or base case. And then looked at a couple of other shapes that we knew would perform better. And um, on the left were animations. And on the right side is sort of a combination of all the different analysis results. This is a similar project, um, a more recent one where another project that has an atrium, we couldn't put anything above the building. So what we did in the atrium is created a sculpture of metal panels that are reflected. And they're hanging on wires, and the panels are facing in different directions. And we looked at um, optimizing those directions almost intuitively, but then ran these animations to show their effect. So the light's coming in, it's reflecting off the panels, and then hitting the side walls of the atrium. And the dots show where they're hitting the sidewalks. This reflection analysis is for the outside of a building, where it's really an environmental analysis. We want to know what effect on the surrounding area our building is going to have. And because of its shape, we know that there's a potential for it to be a problem. Uh, because it's a convex shape, we know that the light might be focused as it's being reflected. And there have been some news stories um, recently where it has been a problem. So we, we try to analyze, um, if we're doing a building like this, um, we try to analyze it so we can avoid the problem. Uh, so in the animation where the dots are close together, so this is one day, going through one day. When the dots are close together, there's a potential for an issue. Right? The, the light is going to be focused or concentrated there. There was also a neighboring building, and we wanted to know the effect on the neighboring building. So the blue dots are on the ground, those red dots are on the neighboring building. And this is for one instant. And we did the analysis throughout the entire year. <clears throat> this isn't really environmental analysis, um, although we get the same colors. This analysis is sort of a geometry analysis, or fabrication analysis, where for this building, we, and there are two of them, um, there's twin buildings that are exactly the same shape. Uh, we looked at different methods of installing the glass to get a shape of a building that looks like this, that, that's curved and, and not regular as it goes up. It's not a simple extrusion. And there are various ways to put glass on the building that's flat. Right? Glass wants to be flat. Glass wants to be rectangular. Glass wants to be equal in size, as many similar pieces of glass as possible. It is possible, however, recently, maybe the last 15, 20 years, to actually bend the glass as it's being placed in the building. So the glass gets delivered to the site flat, but as it's being installed, if you 
fixed three corners, you're able to push the fourth corner onto the building. And there's a limit to how far you can push it before either it'll break or the, the glass manufacturer won't warranty it. So this is a test for how much the glass is bending in different parts of the building. The colors, the areas that are colored blue are almost bending not at all, right? They're pretty much flat. And then the ones in red are bending a lot. And the ones in between are bending, you know, less. So this, this, this analysis was actually done in AutoCAD. In AutoCAD, we can read the polygons, we can look at the corners and, and figure out uh, how much out of plane is the fourth point from the plane of the other three. Um, would that then help you determine if some of the glass should be warm bend or cold bend? Exactly. Or wet, uh, hot bend? Yes. E either if some of the glass should be hot bend, or maybe that glass needs to be triangulated or some other solution in those areas. Or maybe we can modify the form so that it's not an issue, so that less of the glass is, is red. Right? We can change the form slightly so that it's not bending. So in the analysis, we, we can actually include the numbers. How far out of plane is that fourth point? And the numbers vary from close to zero to close to 50. And 50 is about two inches, and that's generally, generally the, the, the limit. We also um, use Excel as an analysis tool and as a visualization tool. And this is the same information in the AutoCAD model in Excel. So these are the coordinates, the X, Y, Z coordinates of all the panels in the building. And then once we have these coordinates, we can figure out how much out of plane is the fourth point from the plane of the other three. And the values in Excel on the left side are the same numbers that we saw in AutoCAD, just computed in Excel. And here we can also color code it. We can also, with Excel, do numerical or statistical analysis. So we can find out how many are almost flat. So maybe zero to 10, you know, 10 maybe is within a tolerance so that it would be considered flat. It could fit inside of a, of a standard frame without having to worry about it. Um, and how many are beyond the limit. But graphically, it doesn't show us which ones there are or how many there are that are a potential problem. So we can also, using Excel, color code it a different way. So instead of doing a gradient color, we can have a discrete coloring system where the panels in blue are pretty much flat, right? They're, they're within a tolerance. The ones in yellow are bending, but they're within the limits. It's fine to bend those. The ones in red are beyond a limit that we can set in Excel. Right? So anything that's beyond 25, show me in red. And also count them, because I want to know how many panels a potential problem that I either need to hot bend or figure out some other solution for. And you know, maybe if I wait a few years and this te technology improves, or maybe if I go to a different manufacturer, they're going to give me a different number. And then if I plug that different number in, I get a different set of results. Same data, same building, but it's a different, uh, different result. This is an example of a zoning analysis that was done for a building a building in New York City. And in Midtown, they have some strict zoning regulations. And the city zoning code for buildings in Midtown Manhattan gives you two choices to comply with the, with the zoning regulations. One of the choices is, is called encroachment and compensating recess. And this is part of the zoning code that describes that. Sorry, we just heard reports that they have to use black. Okay. Yeah, only seeing the open paint. You know, I think it might be because they're looking at the screen. Mm -hmm. Is that, yeah. They're looking at the screen. Okay. <coughs> can they see it now? Yeah, I think we can. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh. So encroachment and compensating recess defines a building envelope based on the street widths that are surrounding the building. And it's not a simple envelope. It tells you for every 10 feet that you go up, you have to set back this much. And so they give you numbers, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, and you get a shape that looks like this. And then this is the building, the second image that we were designing. 
And then if we superimpose those two models, we can see what parts of the building are encroaching or going beyond the envelope, and what parts are staying within, with, what parts are recessed, staying within the envelope. And what we can do is cut floor plans and make sure that the area of encroachment at each level is at least equal to the area, the area of recess is at least equal to the area of encroachment. That's one option that the city gives you. Another option that the city gives you is a little bit more complicated. It doesn't say you have to build an envelope that, to test against. It says you have to stand in the middle of the street in front of the building. And for each street, you usually have to stand in two places. They tell you exactly where that is. And if your building has multiple street fronts, you have to do this for every street front. And it says stand in that place, look up at the building, and anything up to 70 degrees is OK. right? Anything above 70 degrees, you have to divide the sky into a grid. And there are 100 squares in that grid of the sky above 70 degrees. And if your building is touching any of those grids, right, from where you're standing, if the projection of your building is inside any one of those grid squares, you get points taken away. And then you have to score the building for each one of those views. And you have to get a passing score in order for it to pass. And this is a diagram of what that analysis looks like, a diagram that the city requires. Right? So we had a tool using a version of the software that SOM wrote uh, we, we, in the 70s and 80s before AutoCAD was available or any uh, tool for architects was available, SOM decided we're going to write our own. And this was one of the plugins for that um, SOM proprietary tool. And it, took, it was very quick. right? It took maybe 10 minutes once you had a model of the building and were able to identify information about the street widths so it knew where to stand. Um, it could do this very quickly. So we were able to use it as a design tool because if we didn't pass, we could look at the image and say, maybe if I take a little bit away from this corner, I can get a passing score because I'll free up some of those squares. And then run it again, and in 10 minutes, we get, we get an updated score. And then we can actually give these to the city because it requires, if you use this method, the city requires you to submit drawings like this. And because this was easy for us to do, and the other method is also pretty easy, we could use both methods and figure out which one is better for the building that we want to design. Okay, so whenever we did a building in Manhattan, we always analyzed it from both points of view. After we stopped using our own software, and this plugin wasn't available anymore, and we were still doing some buildings in Manhattan, we had to do this manually. And still using computers, but without this tool that did it very quickly. So I used to do these all the time, and I love doing these diagrams there. I think geometrically interesting and visually interesting as well. Without the tool, what used to take about 10 minutes took a couple of days. So it was very frustrating. And then we started to get quicker, right? We learned techniques using AutoCAD and Excel to make the process a little bit faster. And we didn't do enough buildings in New York to, um, to say, OK, let's write a tool again, because that is also a lot of, a lot of effort. Um, we're starting to do more buildings in Manhattan, and this code is still applicable. So we started writing a Grasshopper tool. So we have, now we have, again, what we had before. So a different, different kind of analysis. Another code analysis. This is for a building in Boston. And we were doing this building in the late 80s. And they were about to pass a law in Boston at the time we were designing this building that said any new building that's built near the Boston Commons is not allowed to cast any new shadow on the park. Right? No new shadow at all. So we, we always do shadow analyses. If we have a building and we have a you know, context with existing buildings, we can always test um, how much of a new shadow is our building going to cast. But if we have to abide by a law that says we can't cast any new shadow, uh, you know, we could <coughs> use trial and error, build a building, cast the shadow, see if it passes. If it doesn't pass, you know, go back and fix it. Uh, or what we did in this case is we wrote a program to generate an envelope based on the location of the site and the location of the park and surrounding context, and generate a no shadow envelope. So this white mesh is an envelope that we know will never cast a shadow. And as long as we keep within that envelope, our building will abide by that code. So this was in the late 80s. 
a long time ago. We used actually our old program to, to write this code. It was another one of those plugins. And the law still exists. So whenever we do a building in Boston or the Boston Commons, we need to abide by that code. And recently, we designed another building in Boston near the Boston Common, and we had to we had to use this code again. In this type, in this case, we did the analysis using Grasshopper. And so sort of the steps of the analysis are here. We have our site. We extruded the entire site up some huge amount, like a thousand feet. Uh, we cast shadows, not of that extrusion, but of all the surrounding buildings at a particular instant on the park. And what's in yellow in the park is where the sun is, is falling. So there are no shadows where there's yellow. And then what we did is we projected those yellow areas back towards the sun. Right? We know the date and time, we know the latitude longitude, we know the sun vector. We projected those surfaces in the direction um, towards the sun, and then we flipped the building using those new volumes that we created. So we're not allowed to build anything in these clipped volumes. Okay, we can build below it, that's fine. We can even build above it, because those shadows will be cast beyond the car. <laughs> Except if we have a column to hold that up, it's going to cast a shadow, so we, we really couldn't do that. Can you measure that? So th this is one instant, right? So we had to do this for many instances. So the volume kept getting chipped away. We did maybe 10 minute increments to, to find a volume uh, that we can use. And this is the shape that we developed, and we designed a building to fit within that no shadow envelope. We've also have done some optimization. So we have some optimization tools. We use various um, techniques. Uh, the top left image is an optimization where we're trying to find a form of a building that had a particular volume or area and had a particular um, wind effect. Right? It was most it was optimized to, to resist wind. And we actually ran that optimization using a couple of different routines. People in our structural group did and came up with the same form. Right, it's sort of this teardrop form. So it's heavy at the bottom and gets, gets very thin at the top. So from a wind point of view, that's the optimal form of real. Okay. Why don't all buildings look that way? All tall buildings. There's, there's, wind is one aspect that we look at. And it's an important one, but there are other ones as well. It might be hard to fit an office or even a residential apartment up near the top because the floor plates get so small. Another optimization was for a site in Chicago where we optimized for solar exposure. So we wanted to minimize solar exposure based on all the surrounding buildings. So we ran a whole bunch of um, tests to see um, which ones would, would have the least solar exposure, would have the least exposure to the sun. We're also starting to use optimization in energy analysis. So we, if we have different variations of a model, if we have a building with fins that can be different sizes, um, Sometimes we're looking at um, things that we do to the facade, like sawtooth facades. Um, what should the spacing of the sawtooths be? What should the angle be? Right, we can test a whole bunch of variations. In this case, we were using some cloud computing techniques to come up with many different um, answers. Right? So we run an energy model for maybe a thousand different variations of the building. And then in, in Excel, for example, we can analyze and find out which one is the best, or what the trends are. Sometimes the best isn't always the best. If we're looking at fins, for example, vertical fins on the building, it's going to tell us that a long fin is going to be better than a fin that's shorter. Right? If you have a six meter fin, it's going to shade the windows very well. But we can't have a six meter fin. But this analysis can tell us that maybe beyond a meter and a half, it starts to flatten out. So if it's a meter and a half, it's doing very well. If it's two meters, it's also doing very well, but not that much better than a meter and a half. So a meter and a half is probably fine. Okay? It doesn't optimize as well as two meters, but uh, it, two meters isn't that much of a benefit. Right? So we're using these tools to find out things like that, to see trends and sensitivities. These are some examples of optimization and, and tools that our structures group is, is creating. Uh, one of them is, is called a polytop tool. And it takes a volume of space in two dimensions or even three dimensions, and given supports and loads, tries to figure out what part of that volume is doing the most work. And then that can tell us what the optimal structure is for that, for that volume. It's 
to this for the length. So we start out with a blank volume, and it's it's an iterative process. So it's it's testing in, in many generations um, every cell in that volume and trying to figure out which cell is doing the most work. So which cells do we can we get rid of and which cells should remain? So the supports are at the end, and we have loads uh, along the top. This is what the ideal form based on those criteria will be. And again, we often use this as a hint, right? We don't say this is this is our design. We say maybe our design should look something like this because there are other aspects that we need to consider as well. So this was um, done initially with square cells. So we have a you know a square, a, a rectangular grid of pixels or a three-dimensional grid of cubic voxels, and that sometimes causes problems because we can have two adjacent pixels or adjacent at their corners, but then they meet at a point, and, and there's a problem there. Uh, so what we started doing is instead of using square pixels, we use a Voronoi grid to do the analysis, and then it's, we, we get much better results. And that sometimes accounts for some of the asymmetry that we see in the, in the analyses, because it's not a regular grid. Our structures research group is also looking at um, various different structural systems. So this one is a Mitchell truss that was actually discovered or invented about 100 years ago by a physicist named Mitchell. I think he was Australian. And uh, we're, we're sort of looking at that again. It wasn't used when it was discovered because it's not easy to build. But now we can do it and, and looking at, at, at ways to use that. Wind is a huge factor in the design of tall buildings, especially. So for every building that we do, even for competitions recently, we're always looking at wind analysis. How is this building going to behave in the wind? Or if we're looking at two different options, which option is better from a wind point of view? And it's the software that's available, the CFD software that's available that can do these kinds of analyses. Our structures group is sort of skeptical about the quality of the results, about how good they are, and really analyzing in a correct way um, the, the wind, the effect of the wind. A physical wind tunnel is much better. Uh, the problem is, especially if we're doing a competition, we have three weeks to do the competition, a uh, physical wind tunnel takes much longer than that. We have to build a model, we have to send it, we have to wait for the results, get them back. It often is, is, is much too late, um, especially in a competition or in the early phases of design. To, to, to use that to influence the design. So we do rely on computational tools. Uh, here's a couple of videos. So these two buildings are exactly the same, but they're oriented differently. So one of them, the point is facing the wind. The other one, the flat side of the triangular building is facing the wind. And the uh, behavior of the wind is very different around those two shapes. So because wind tunnels, physical wind tunnels, we think are the best way to analyze a building, we decided to build one. So, <laughs> so on the second floor, right, we have, we have three floors in this building, 9, 10, and 5. Um, we also have a room on the second floor where we build a wind tunnel, and we can do tests there. It's limited. We can't test everything uh, that, that a regular wind tunnel would test. A regular wind tunnel will often test things like pressure on the facade. Uh, we can only test if we have a tall building what the overturning pressure is. So there are sensors at the bottom of the building, at the base, and they're very sensitive. And we can figure out for different shapes what the differences are. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about daylighting and some of the daylighting analysis studies that we've done. Uh, actually, I think most of my presentation is about daylighting studies. And uh, this is a space in New York. This is Grand Central Terminal. Uh, you know, some things are hard to analyze. I think in a space like this, we would never analyze the effect, this, this particular effect, right? How can you analyze something like this? It's, it's an incredible effect. And you know, this was probably taken when most people in the, in the terminal were smoking. And I'm sure smoking <laughs> has a lot to do with the, with the light that you see. Um, but even today, when you go there, the light coming through those overhead windows is, is, is just beautiful. It's a beautiful space. 
even contemporary spaces, right? So this is a um, the Louvre by Jean Nouvel in Abu Dhabi. Uh, this is an S01 building, and, and the intention of this building is not to let light in. This is a rare book library, the Barnaby Library at Yale University, and the rare books are sensitive to light, so we don't want to um, have them affected by, by direct sunlight. They would be negatively affected. So this building was designed with no glass, right? The, the, the walls are made of a very thin um, marble, and it does let some light in, but not enough light to damage the book, and it's also a beautiful space, and I don't think any analysis program that's available can, uh, can show you <laughs> what it feels like to be in the space. Some other projects, you know, Louis Kahn wrote a lot about light and architecture. Uh, light really is uh, one of the main uh, effects of architecture. Light makes the building. So there are tools to analyze daylight. And there were tools um, developed before computers were developed to analyze daylight in the building. So this is one of them where you build a physical model of the building, and then you can um, angle it based, I guess, on the latitude and have lights around it that can um, simulate the sun. A couple of years ago, I was in, at a conference in Brazil in Florianopolis, and they have an um, environmental simulation lab and they actually built one of these to do physical analysis of models. So even though we have computational tools, tools like this, right, like a physical wind tunnel, tools like this are still being used to analyze them. Okay, so here's a case study. We're doing a building now. It just started construction in Chicago, 1515 Webster. And the analysis that I'm going to show you is of skylights in that building. So this is what the building looks like. There's an atrium in the middle of the building. And it's a short building, it's only four stories tall, and there's an atrium in the middle. And the intention is, um, it has a big floor plate, right? It's not very tall, but it has a big floor plate to use the atrium to help bring light into the space, daylight into the space. So here's a floor plan. <laughs> so we were looking at five different options for skylights to help bring light in. Uh, one of them is sort of a big flat skylight, so it's almost as if the, the top is open, right? Letting as much light in as possible. Uh, another option was to raise the skylight and make it smaller. And then other options, instead of having horizontal glass, horizontal openings have vertical openings, like clear story openings, right? And what will be the difference? Will they let enough light in? Will they prevent too much light from coming in? Which is another issue, right? Glare is something that we want to avoid. We want to let in daylight, but not too much. So here are sections through them. Option, five, option three and option five are similar, except that the clear stories are in a different direction. In option three, they're sort of linear in the long direction of the building. In option five, it's almost like a scallop. Right? There are many of them. So we took one section of the building and analyzed it. So if you look at a floor plan, we, we looked at the section in red. And for one particular day, March 21st, um, using Diva in this case um, to do the daylight analysis, um, this is how much light is, is, is coming in. So this is um, UDI, Useful Daylight Index. So what's in blue is um, no, actually, this is lux. These are lux values. So blue are low, low lux values, and red are high lux values. And we can also animate that. Right? Instead of having a whole bunch of sequences, we can animate it. Another way to do this analysis is instead of analyzing horizontal surfaces, because we would have to analyze many different floors, uh, is to cut a section through the building. So we cut a section where this line is, and instead of the sensors being on the horizontal planes, we put the sensors on this vertical plane. So you can see the vertical plane. And we tested each one of the skylights. So this shows lux values. 
throughout an entire day. And then we scored that analysis. So this is UDI, Useful Day Light Index. And it's saying, when is the light within some range that's comfortable? So it's not too low and it's not too high. And the numbers are percentages from 0 to 100 of the time throughout the entire year when the light at that particular sensor is going to be OK, when it's going to be comfortable to be in that space. And we're looking in particular at the uh, spaces just above the desks, just above the floors. So in the middle of the atrium, it's, the numbers are very low. And in this case, because the light is too high, because the less value, as we saw, it was in red uh, previously. So these numbers are very low because it's getting too much light. Um, some of the numbers, like under the ceiling, are low because it's not getting enough light. But the, the values in yellow are actually good values. So for this particular skylight, and then we took the average of all of these numbers and gave this scheme a score. So the score for this scheme is about 31. Okay. About 31% of these pixels are getting good light. And then we tested the second scheme, did the same analysis. Got the score. This one scored a 61. Right. So the smaller skylight is letting less light in, and it's getting a higher score because of less light, because there's not too much light. But the um, displaying of the walls actually enhances what light's coming in. It does, yes, yes, yes. And we didn't assign a material to the walls, it's a default material, but it, it probably does have some reflectance value. So the light, second light is probably being reflected in a good way down into the space. Okay, now with the clear story scheme. This is option three. And you know, there are some anomalies, which I noticed as I was doing the analysis. So sometimes you see these red streaks that, you know, you, intuitively you think shouldn't be there. And after I ran the analysis, I took a closer look at the model and saw that there were some holes in the model. So usually, usually when I do this analysis, I don't build the models, right? Sometimes I do, but usually the design team already built the model. They're using it for renderings, they're using it for other things that they use the model for. So ideally, I can just get a model that's already built from there and then just use it to analyze. Uh, there's almost never a case where I could just use the model as it is. Often there's too much information in the model. It's got all the mulligans, it's got all the um, details that look beautiful in a rendering, but will take the analysis tool too long to analyze because it has so much detail in it. So usually I spend time cleaning up. Um, sometimes I need to spend time, and in this case I didn't, fixing problems like openings or holes in the model, right? It wasn't constructed well. In the rendering it's fine, you don't notice it, but when you do this analysis, it, it, it can be a problem. So that's probably slightly affecting the score. However, it got a good score, right, 71. Option four is the same as option three, except it has these reflectors. And in this case, we did assign a reflective material. So trying to bring the light in, but also reflect it down. And this one got a slightly higher score. So instead of 71, it got a 72. And then this um, analysis was with the um, clear stories in the opposite direction. So in, in the previous cases, it didn't matter where that analysis plane was. In this one, it, it, it does make a difference. We sort of put it in the middle of, of the two clear stories. And this one got a little bit lower score. Right? Um, moving the analysis plane might have changed the score. So option three was the winner. Well, option four was the winner, but option three wasn't that much worse. And option four had these reflectors that were probably very expensive to install. So we said, let's go with option three. I tried to put all these on the same page, I guess. <laughs> that wasn't too successful. So these are all the scores. So option three was 71 and a half, which was pretty good. Option four was 72, but didn't really warrant the expense of adding that additional feature. We also wanted to look at glare. 
And between the time that we did that analysis and the time that we did the glare analysis, the client said, we don't want to spend that much money, as much money as, as we said, that skylight, that one, right, option three, um, they didn't want to spend even that much money. So they said, can we get cheaper skylights? So we proposed a system of skylights that are squares, right, so they're more typical skylights. I think they're three feet or three and a half feet square. And we did the same analysis on those, actually. And then we also did this glare analysis because they were concerned that um, people sitting at the desks are going to experience glare with any skylights at all. So we said we would analyze them. We um, took two points of view when we thought it might be a problem. They're both sort of looking south. One of them is looking parallel to the atrium. The other one is looking directly south and across the atrium. So here's one of the views. This might be too short, so this might be my view. And then this one, <laughs> this is probably at a more appropriate height. So sitting at the desk, from those two points of view. And then also using Diva, the glare analysis. Can those analyses account for printed glass or different types of? No, this, that, 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 that's one, um, one device we can use to, um, to, to, to make less the effect of, of the glare problem. But this doesn't use pretty glass. In fact, in this case, I removed the glass, so it's just open, letting as much light in as possible. But you can use a assigned material that has a lower BLT. Yes, right? exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. In this case, we we just, we we analyzed for the worst case. Got it. Okay. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide? What is the definition of the glare glass you have here? I'm just curious. It um you know the. <laughs> I was talking with, when we were doing the study, with our um, engineers who know a lot more about glare than I do. I know how to use the tools in the analysis, but they know all the definitions. It's very subjective. And it has to do with, um, with a, um, almost a poll, right? A population of what they think will be comfortable. And different people are comfortable with different amounts of light that they get. And this is sort of an average. So. Uh, yeah. It also has to do with the location of the bright versus dark contrast, yes. mm -hmm. correct? Right. So it's not exactly, not just how much light is coming to a particular sensor, but what you see. And that's what these views try to tell you. They, they, they show the contrast between light and dark. I remember right, I think the, uh, the outer edges are something like 1 in 10 or something like that. I heard 1 in 20 and 10 below would be something that's considered clear which is uh, very similar to the range of the lead, so this uh, 25 foot candle to 500 foot candle, mm -hmm. which is about 20 times the But I believe it's, it's different towards the center of your vision versus right. the periphery. So I don't know if these tools get into that much detail. <laughs> <laughs> they probably should. We can draw the bullseye targets on them, right? So you can see. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So the, the, these analysis let you specify one instant, right? And at that instant, based on the location of the sun and the architecture and how much light is coming in, you get these results. And we're interested in more than one instant because we want to have a bigger picture of the effect over an entire day or the entire year. So we, we did many instances. And most of them are fine. Um, there's a little code here based on the percent of, of glare of the project. <coughs> Uh, it says imperceptible glare. And I think almost every study that we did, every instance that we picked, says imperceptible, except for one. Uh, this one, it's, it's 44%. And I think it's, it's above the threshold that this poll says it's comfortable. So that one says that there is a glare problem. But generally, it was fine. <coughs> And then Deep also gives you another analysis type that sort of does the analysis over the entire year. You don't get the images, but you get those percentage values um, for every hour of every day of the year. So this chart shows 8,760 values. And it's, it's organized um, by dates horizontally and by hours vertically. So we can see most of the time it's okay. Like yellow is, 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 is not a big problem because <coughs> like 35% uh, below the threshold that, that they say is a problem. Um, red might be a problem, it's above that threshold. And it's only a problem, like, 
not all year, but sometimes of the year, and not during the middle of the day, when people are probably sitting at the desks, but at the beginning of the day. Yeah. I see before 8, which wouldn't be a problem, but at 3 o'clock, there's sometimes a problem. It's, it's an office building. And then we, we, we said some of this glare is not going to be caused by the skylights, which we were concerned about. Some of the glare is going to be caused by the windows. Right? So we said, OK, suppose we only analyze the skylights. Right? We, we make the windows black, pull all the shades down, which people are going to do anyway if there's going to be a glare problem. Uh, so we, we, we took out all the windows. We made them black. We made them opaque. And this shows only the skylight problem. So this is view A. Um, this is view B with the windows and view B without the windows. And there was one incident <laughs> that's red. And we, we said, oh, no, the client is going to flip out. And we, we have to do something about that. So uh, this, this sort of shows that problem in a, in, a, in a slightly different way. So here's the, for one day in June, June 21st, we're showing the path of the sun. What we did is show the light coming through the skylights. Do I need to run this? So this is June 21st from morning to evening. I'm showing the light that's coming through the skylight and where it's going to hit the desk. And if you blinked, you probably missed a lot of the problem areas. It turns out that the third floor is actually worse than the fourth floor. Right? The fourth floor is actually closer to the skylight. But um, because of, I guess, the distance and the angle that the sun is traveling, the third floor actually has the worst problem. Uh, the ground floor is actually getting the most sun on the, on, the, on the floor itself, under the atrium, but there are no desks there, so that's not a problem. Sir, Neil? Yes. Uh, did you analyze it? Were the uh, satellites of their own objects, or were, were they all in place? They're all in place. Oh, okay. Yeah. So where the fourth floor is blocking the sun from the third floor, we're showing that. And then this animation is, is cumulative. So when, a, when the sun hits a spot, it's, it's, it's staying there. So we can visually see it. So here we can see that at some instance on the third floor, some of the desks are being hit by sun. And this isn't glare the same way that we saw it before. When we're taking a view sitting at a desk and looking, right, looking away, this is actually sun hitting the desk itself, which they were also concerned about. The client was concerned. You know, someone is working at a desk, and at some point in the afternoon, there's going to be a spot of sun that's hitting their desk. And they, they, they were concerned about that. So they asked us to look at that, right? So we, we, we uh, they like these skylights. So we keep, we, we, we kept the skylights. They're part of the design. But we had to design something to minimize the effect of the few times of the year when the sun would actually hit someone's desk. And the way that we did that is we, and I don't have any images, I don't think, of that. We, we designed these hanging lanterns that go around the skylights, around pairs of skylights, that when the light is coming through, um, it's sort of screened by these lanterns. It doesn't block the light completely, but it, it screens the light. And visually, we were happy with that. I'm sorry, I don't have an image of it. Uh, but, uh, and the client was happy with it as well, both visually and also that it would block the light that's causing the problem. Uh, another building, which um, is also a funky shape, it's, it's a triangular building with curved edges. Uh, we, these are so easy to do, these deep analyses that show how much light is coming into a space. And based on the leaf span, how deep is it able to get? Right? In Diva, these have become so easy that we, we pretty much do these on every single project that we do. And if there's a problem because we have a long leaf span, then we uh, try to figure out ways to address that. Uh, either with atriums, if we can, put an atrium in the building, or with um, devices on the exterior of the building, like a light shelf, right, to help direct the light in deeper, deeper into the space. Uh, this project was actually done about five years ago. So Diva was available, but still very young in its infancy. So I want to go through a few um, aspects of this project. In addition to doing daylighting for this project, we also did some energy analysis. Uh, it's a mixed-use project, um, several buildings. And it has office and hotel and residential functions, as well as retail and exhibition. And there was a question as to whether each building should have its own power plant 
or whether there should be one central plan for the entire project, for all the buildings. And that was the, um, the intention of this analysis, to show the effect of energy and how different buildings would be using energy at different times. So the building was still being designed. This was very early in the design phase. So what we did is we took typical buildings and using Energy Plus analyzed different uses, uh, office, residential, hotel, and accumulated all the results in an Excel file. So we get the watt hours per meter squared of energy that these typical uses are using in, in a building. And then we analyze those numbers in Excel. So over the course of a year, an office building is going to use power uh, at these dates and times. And the vertical stripes are weekends, right? Energy Plus uses the schedule, so it knows when people are not going to be in the office. And the most energy is used from, from 9 to 5. Uh, we also analyze uh, different, at, different energy aspects in an office building, like heating and cooling and gas. And then we also analyze those same things for different types of buildings. So for a residential building, for a hotel, and we came up with these with these diagrams. And it's interesting to visually compare them in this in this way because it makes it very easy to see the difference between, say, a residential building and a hotel, or a residential building and an office building in terms of heating, cooling, power. Right. So when you visualize the information this way, it 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 it, it tells a different story or a more clear story maybe. And then we said, how can we apply that information to the project itself? So we took our model of the building, and we took one day each month of the year. So one day in January, one day in February, one day in March. And during the course of the day, we showed how much, in this case, um, power the different functions are using. And we showed that where the functions are. So one of these towers is an office building, another one is a hotel and a residential building. So as we're moving through time, <coughs> the color is changing based on how much energy that function is using. And what we wanted to show is that it balances out, right, more or less. So when the office is using a lot of energy, people are working in the offices, the hotel and the residential buildings are using much less energy. Because during the day, people aren't there as much. And these are color coded in two ways. So in this case, we color coded using green for less energy and red for more energy on the left side. On the right side, we color coded based on the function of the building. We thought maybe it would be more clear to read, to read it that way, except where the color is very light, it's using less energy. Where the color is deeper, it's using more energy. And people had different opinions about which system of color coding the buildings based on energy was easier to understand. We, we tried to take a poll, but the opinions were so varied <laughs> that it, was, it, it really didn't matter. Some people liked one, some people liked the other, or some people didn't care. For the same project, we did daylight analysis. And this is analyzed using DIVA, but the results are accumulated in Excel and visualized in Excel. So this is an Excel <coughs> chart, this, this plan. And we analyzed three different things, three or four different um, window wall ratios for this building, and how the window wall ratio is affecting the lighting in the building. So this is one of those towers. This is the office tower. This is the shape of it and the two openings of the two cords in the building. So we, using Excel, we have all the data for every hour of every day of the year, all the daylight information. So we can create a chart for each point in the building that looks like this. Over the entire year, for one point in the building, how much light is that point getting? Mm -hmm. Did you ever combine like a new luxury solver? Like 
we, we, we haven't, but you know, that, that kind of iterative optimization is, is, is definitely a possibility. We have not done that yet. So here we can see both types of charts. Both of these are done or uh, visualized in Excel. So on the plan, we have one spot on the plan, and that spot is what's analyzed in this chart above. So for this particular spot, this is what the yearly diagram looks like. So for this spot, these are the times that it's getting a lot of light. And this circle indicates a particular instant. So this floor plan represents the light that every point on the plan is getting at that particular instant. And this is for the 60% window wall ratio. And you know, Excel is, is great. It, it, make, it, it, it's, it was much faster to visualize it this way in Excel than any other tool. But Excel, with this much data, right, we had four sets of data, 8,760 points for each, points of information for each point on the floor plan. Right? There are hundreds of points on the floor plan. So it's still a lot of information and, and times four different window wall ratios. What would be ideal is if I can graphically move this circle around the plan and then see this chart change right, instantly. Or take this circle and move it around right, and see this floor plan change for a different time of year. Right? When I change one of the variables, like the date and time or the window wall ratio, it actually took several minutes for Excel to recompute the, the graphics. Maybe I should complain that my computer's not fast enough even for Excel, but <laughs> it's, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of numbers. Right. And this is what the file looks like. This is what the um, results file from Devo looks like, the ILL file. Right. We get two files. We get a points file, um, which um, I sort of copied up at the top. Each point on the building, it's x, y, z coordinates. Um, and we get the, the light values for each point um, for every hour of the year. So you can see as the window wall ratio is changing, these numbers are changing as well. So going down the chart, if we take any particular point, we get 8,760 values, and we could show them this way. If we look horizontally, we get one number for every location on the plan. We can visualize it this way. Sorry, when you analyze the window wall ratio, mm -hmm. did you um, geometry of that division, like in terms of like whether it's a horizontal band or something else. Yep. So we we only use horizontal bands, um, and the bottom one is fixed, and the top one gets bigger and smaller, except for the one hundred percent. We said what's a hundred percent window wall ratio? That's all glass from floor to ceiling, and we removed all the opaque parts of the wall. So there's fifty percent, sixty percent. 70%, we could see how the numbers are changing, and 100% has no opaque areas at all. And then we can look at a different spot, and same thing. And then in Excel, we can also analyze it in different ways. So if I take a section of the building, I can use a line graph to show me where are the hot spots, where, where's the most light in that section, that horizontal section coming through. So there are four lines here. Each one represents a different window wall ratio. Right? So 100%, of course, is going to give you the most light, but how much more? Maybe it's not that much. Or if we have that chart, we can look at different times of the year. Right? How much more light is coming at that section in, in, in different months, in December, in March, in, in, in June. So we can look at different times. So now we're scrolling through times and see what the effect is. Same thing, scrolling through times in the plan view. We can look at different sections. So now we have a section line in the back of the building. As we bring the section line forward, how are the numbers changing? Right now we hit the core. And 
finally to end up with a couple of different light examples. Um, two projects. One of them is a cathedral. And, and both of these projects are a little bit unique for Skidmongs and Merrill. Um, they're not super tall towers. So this is a cathedral in Oakland. It's, it's a relatively small building. And for the cathedral, it's called the Cathedral of Christ the Light. And the bishop of the cathedral wanted to create an image of, of Jesus, and he gave us the image that we should use, wanted to create an image of Jesus in the cathedral using light. So what we did is we took the image and we um, analyzed each pixel. And each pixel related to a perforation. And the intensity of the pixel, how light or how dark it was, um, related to the size of the perforation on these metal panels. So in as many panels as 154 panels total in this three-dimensional sculptural wall, 73 of those panels have parts of the image on it. And altogether, there's over 94,000 dots, 94,000 perforations of different sizes. And when, they, when the perforation is bigger, more light comes through. When it's smaller, less light comes through. And that creates the image. So here you can see one panel. It's about 10 feet tall. So that's a huge sculpture. You can see a person down at the bottom. And it's three-dimensional. So after projecting these openings on the three-dimensional sculpture, we had to unfold it so that we can send it to the fabricator, and they can laser cut all the holes. And this is what it looks like. So light is actually coming through. Daylight's coming through to create the image. And even looking at it from the outside, right? if it's dusk or nighttime and the cathedral is lit on the inside, you can still see the image. It's, it's almost ghost-like, in fact. But the intention, this was the intention. And one more project. This is a school that we did in Deerfield, Massachusetts. This was done by the New York office. The cathedral, by the way, was done by a San Francisco office. Um, this was done by the New York office um, when I was in New York. I was working in New York. And for a couple of the school projects, we collaborated with artists. And for this project, we collaborated with James Terrell, who's an artist that works with light. And he had several ideas for how he can contribute to this project. One of them was to create a skylight. And the skylight actually, you can't see from this view, it's just under this lip. It's in the ceiling surface. And there's not much to see. It's a six inch hole. Right, the skylight is just a six inch opening in the ceiling, circular opening. And light comes through that skylight, and it projects a spot of light on the wall. And during the day, that spot of light moves. Right? And it moves in the opposite direction that the sun moves. So the sun is moving from east to west. The spot of light on the wall is moving from west to east, because that, spot, that opening in the ceiling is, is like a focal point. Right? The light is being focused there, and then it changes direction when it gets to the other side. There's another line at the bottom, and that represents the path of the sun when the sun is highest in the sky. And it's low on the wall. It represents the path of the sun in June on the equinox. And there's a similar curve at the top of the wall, which represents the path of light on the solar, um, the winter equinox, when the sun is lowest in the sky. So during the year, that spot of light is going to move throughout between those two lines. And our intention was from morning to evening, the spot would move across the wall. So when the sun comes up, the spot will appear, move across the wall. When the sun goes down in the evening, the spot disappears. Now, the, the opening on the ceiling is a six inch hole. And the distance between the ceiling and the rooftop is about three feet. It's 37 inches. And if we had a cylinder that went from the, roof, from the ceiling to the roof, it wouldn't have any effect. The slide would come on the top, and that's it. Right. So the opening on the roof needed to be much larger. And in order for us to see that spot of light the entire day, it would take up the entire roof, in fact. Right. It would be huge and unfeasible. So we said, OK, what would be a good time frame to see that effect, to see the spot of light move across the wall? And based on the size of the opening necessary and what people might appreciate, right, the students who are in the school, we thought that two hours would be good. So this, um, this line, this very tall figure eight, is called an analemma. And every day at noon, that spot of light's going to cross the analemma. That was always the intention. 
right? Even when we put up a spider web, we last all day. Uh, if you stand in one place, like in your backyard, and you look up at the sun at the same time, right? 12 o'clock or any other time, at the same time every day, and you follow the path of the sun at that instant every day of the year, from one day to the next, it'll be almost in the same position, a slightly different location. But over the entire year, it's going to create this figure eight called an analema. Right? So in June, it's going to be in one location. In December, it's going to be in another location. And between those, it'll create this, this figure eight. So that's what this figure eight is, the projection of that spot every day at noon. So we had to analyze what would the shape of the opening at the top of the roof, right, the roof surface, look like in order to let the light in at exactly 11 o'clock, between 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock for that two-hour period. So we created analemas for also 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock. And we projected them on this theoretical sun sphere. And then we projected those onto a plane that was 37 inches above the focal point. And you can see those projections here. We filled in the area between all the projections, between the, the winter path and the summer path of the sun, and between 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock. And that is the shape of the opening. Right? And it'll let light in if that's the shape of the opening on the roof. And the opening on the ceiling is just a 6-inch hole let light in only between those hours. So this is the shape of the skyline. Right, the bottom is a six inch hole, the opening is that shape. It's about eight feet long at the top and about three feet wide. And that's it. If anyone has any questions here or online, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Are you from post occupancy surveys <coughs> that find your research, or I mean, have they shown better or worse results? You know, um, that's a big issue here in the office. That's a big topic. Um, we haven't done much before now, but we're starting to, to be able to do them because codes are actually requiring, if someone wants their building to be LEED certified, to, to do post occupancy evaluation. Um, before that, it was hard to get a client to say, we want to come back into your space and test what we thought would happen. Um, it is important to do, um, and, and we hope to be able to start doing that soon for things like daylighting and some of the things that I was showing. Which cities are providing or requiring? Well, it's a lead, it's, it's, it's a lead requirement, so it's going to be nationwide. So there are some questions, most of them about not seeing the screen. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, um, so this video was recorded not only through the um, screen capture, but also with the actual camera showing Neil and uh, his hand movements over the projection. So that will be more useful. And uh, we apologize for the technical difficulty we had. But thanks to Com Chicago Computations Group's secondary recording, that will be more useful to watch, and we will post that to both groups. design decision, we hope it's influenced by some analysis that we did. And we often, um, or sometimes I should say, show the analysis to the client to prove that the decision that we made is based on not just willy-nilly, I feel like doing it this way, but based on real analysis. And it's going to provide a better space for the client or save them money, and, and we did the analysis to, to show that. Um, sometimes we'll just not show the analysis, but, but indicate that we did the analysis. Um, you know, and, it will have the same effect. 
thinking that either the client isn't interested or it's too technical. Uh, I don't know if we're always right about that, actually. So uh, one internet question is about uh, taking into account the furniture height in your daylight analysis, I'm assuming, because this was asked like 30 minutes ago. Yes. And if so, how high were the partitions? Was it like 42 inches? That's the question. The partitions? Yes. And I think it could be the cubicles. Well, the, 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 the plan that I said 15, 15 webs, it didn't have any cubicles. Mm -hmm. The desk height was, I forgot exactly what the number was, but it was a standard desk height. Okay. And the analysis, um, whenever we do daylight analysis like that, the sensors are on a plane that is at the desk height. It's not at the floor. It's, it's at a desk. It's at a height where the um, analysis would be most meaningful. Mm -hmm. One question is about the shadow analysis in the tower project. Shadow impact on the park. Is it based on mesh input or nerds? This is very technical. Because the Boolean process in Rhino doesn't work well with the mesh. That's a question from John. Sure. It, 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 it uses meshes. It was so, using a mesh. Okay, it was with a mesh. Another question about the cathedral project. How did you mitigate the impact from sun's position, time and season, in generating the image of Jesus? We didn't. And even if it's not a sunny day, it still has the effect. So okay. as long as it's light out, the light, the light will be able to come through the openings. Is the impact more pronounced with the sun, direct sun? We, we didn't test that. Okay. I've never visited, so I'm, I'm, I can't even say in personal experience. <laughs> it's, it's a great question. Another I'm question sure. is, rather than Excel, have you considered PHP, Java, C++, or other coding to facilitate data visualization from James? Um, personally, I haven't, but there are other people that I work with that are using tools like Tableau. OK. Yeah. Um, it would be, I guess, you know, the, the, the Excel analysis of the daylighting that took a long time every time I changed the parameter mm -hmm. um, could probably be more efficient using one of these other tools. So, uh, personally, I don't know mm -hmm. enough about these other tools, okay. um, and I haven't learned them yet to, to explore that. But, but um, some of the people that I'm working with are interested, in fact, in, in, in helping me do that. So, for the audience, Tableau is a dashboard and data visualization software that does not allow that much data manipulation, but allows for data visualization. And those are the most, like, a, the shortcomings of those tools is that they don't allow you to manipulate the data. They just allow you to present it beautifully if you've already manipulated it through usually a, a database software, such as, like, uh, SQL or any other um, service. But then you would bring it to Tableau and then visualize it. Um, there is a second question from John. How do you think about too late analysis plugins, Honeybee and Ladybug versus Diva? So this is very contentious. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, for, for those who don't know, uh, Lady, uh, Ladybug and Honeybee are free. Diva is not that expensive, but also another plugin for Rhino. And we're, we're looking at both. OK. And starting to do analyses using either one tool or the other to sort of explore what the differences are. OK. Um, I, 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 I've used both of them. I enjoy using both of them. I, I really can't say which one I like better. One thing about Diva is it uses a weather file. Yeah. And um, I think Honeybee does, but Ladybug doesn't require one. So Ladybug does a geometric analysis, mm -hmm. which is also interesting. I've been doing a lot of that using Grasshopper by itself. Okay. So those are the end of internet questions. Thank you very much for attending, and I'm um, sorry to the internet guys for the technical difficulties. We'll make up for it. <laughs> Thanks. Do we need to discord with the conference technical? Thank you. <laughs>